Today we are reading chapter three of Owl in the Family. The next week seemed awfully long. The only time I really hated school was during the springtime, particularly in May when the birds were busy nesting on the prairies. This May week, what with thinking about owls and sitting by the open window sniffing the smells of springtime, I wished school had never been invented. Every recess and after school, Murray and Bruce and I talked about the young owls and tried to think of ways to get them out of their nest. Murray suggested we could cut down the tree, but that was too dangerous because the young owls might get hurt. Bruce said he might get his father to come and shoot the old owl so it would be safe for us to climb the tree, but that wasn't fair. The only thing I could think of was firecrackers. My idea was to get some small sky rockets and let them off under the nest to scare the mother owl away. The trouble was we had no money, and anyway, the storekeepers wouldn't sell sky rockets to kids our age. Then on Friday night, we had a storm of the kind called a Chinook. Chinooks come down out of the Rocky Mountains in Alberta, and sometimes they blow right across Saskatchewan, and they blow like fury. Lying in my bed on Friday night, I could hear branches snapping off the poplar trees along the riverbank. The rain was pelting on the roof so hard that it scared Mutt, who was always asleep under my bed, and made him howl. I had to pull a quilt over his head to make him keep quiet. He hated storms. I worried about the young owls for a long time before I finally fell asleep. Early on Saturday morning, Murray called for me, and we met Bruce at the railroad bridge. It was a fine morning, and the sun kept popping in and out between the white clouds that were racing across the sky, trying to catch up to the Chinook. Everything was steaming from all the rain, and the prairie was soggy wet. We hurried across the fields and didn't care if our feet got soaked, because we were worried about the owls. When they were still quite away from when we were still quite away from the owl bluff, Bruce gave out a shout. Looky, he yelled, Old Miller's blind is gone. Sure enough, six or seven of the biggest cottonwoods were snapped right off at the tops. And for as far as and as far Miller's Mr. Miller's blind, it had been blown clean out of its tree, and nobody ever did find it again. But the worst thing was the owl's nest. The rain and wind had smashed it to pieces, and all that was left was a stick or two stuck in the crotch where the nest had been. There was no sign of the old owls at all, but on the ground near the foot of the tree were two young owls, and they were cold and dead. They were so young they had grown only about half their feathers, and baby down was still sticking to them all over. I didn't know if they were killed by the fall or not, but they were as wet as sponges, and I think they probably died from being so cold and wet all night. We felt as miserable as could be, and all we could think of to do was to have a funeral for the little owls. Bruce had his jackknife with him, and he started to dig a grave while Murray and I went looking for the right kinds of sticks to use for crosses. There was a big pile of brush nearby, and I happened to give it a kick in passing. Something went snap, snap, snap from under it. I shoved my hand under the brush and touched a bundle of wet feathers. Bruce and Murray came over and we pulled the brush away. There was the missing owlet, the third one that had been in the nest, and he was still alive. He was bigger than the other two, and that was probably because he was the first one hatched. Horned owls are funny that way. They begin to lay their eggs in March when it's still winter on the prairie. The eggs are laid a few days apart, but from the time that first one is laid, the mother has to start setting. If she waited until she had a full clutch of eggs, the early ones would be chilled and would never hatch. The first egg that's laid hatches first, and that young owl gets a four or five day head start on the next one, who in turn gets a head start on the next one. The one we found must have been the first to hatch because not only was he bigger than the others, but he must have been a lot stronger too. When the nest blew apart, he fell to the ground and he was able to wiggle under the pile of brush for shelter, and that probably saved his life. He was about as big as a chicken, and you could see his grown up feathers pushing through the baby down. He even had the beginnings of two horn feathers growing on his head. A surprising thing about him was that he was almost pure white, with only small black markings on the ends of his feathers. When we found him, he looked completely miserable because all his down and feathers were stuck together in clumps and he was shivering like a leaf. I thought he would be too miserable to feel like fighting, but when I tried to pick him up, he hunched forward, spread his wings and hissed at me. It was a good try, but he was too weak to keep it up and he fell right over on his face. I was still a little bit afraid of him because his claws were long and sharp and his beak, which he kept snapping, seemed big enough to bite off my finger. But he did look so wet and sad that after a while I stopped being afraid. I got down on my knees in front of him very slowly and put my hand on his back. He hunched down as if he thought I was going to hurt him. But when I didn't hurt, he stopped hissing and laid still. He felt as cold as ice. I took off my shirt and put it over him and then I picked him up as carefully as I could and carried him out to the bluff out of the bluff so he could sit in the sunshine and get dry and warm again. 
It was surprising how fast he started getting better. In half an hour, his feathers were dry and he was standing up looking around him. Murray had brought along some roast beef sandwiches for lunch. He took some meat out of the sandwiches and he held it out to the owl. The owl looked at him a minute with his head to the side. Then it gave a funny little hop and came close enough to snatch the meat out of Murray's fingers. It gave a couple of gulps, blinked his eyes once, and the meat was gone. He was certainly a hungry owl. He ate all the meat we had and most of the bread as well. When I found some dead mice that his mother must have left on the edge of the nest, which also had been blown to the ground, the owl ate them too. They must have been hard to swallow because he ate them whole, but he got him down somehow. After that, we were friends. When Bruce and I started to walk away from him just to see what he would do, the owl followed right along behind us like a dog. He couldn't fly, of course, and he couldn't walk too well either. He kind of jumped along, but he stayed right with us all the same. I think he wasn't, he knew he was an orphan and that if he stayed with us, we'd look after him. When I sat down again, he came up beside me and after taking a sideways look into my face, he hopped up on my leg. I was afraid his claws would go right through my skin, but they didn't hurt at all. He was being very careful. Guess he's your owl, all right, Bruce said, and I could see he was a little jealous. No, sir, Bruce, I replied. He can live at my place, but he's going to be our owl, all three of us. We left him sitting in the sun by the haversacks, and then we buried the other two little owls and had a funeral over them. After that, we were ready to go home. We decided the best way to carry our new pet was to put him in my haversack. He didn't like it much, but after a struggle, we managed to stuff him into it. We left his head sticking out so he could see where he was going. Mutt and Bruce's dog Rex hadn't been with us that morning. I think the two of them had gone off cat hunting before we got up. But as we were walking along the sidewalk in front of my house, we met old Mutt coming back from wherever he'd been. Mutt was cross-eyed and short-sighted, and so he never could see any way too well. He came up to me and said hello, wagging his tail long and sniffing me. And then suddenly he smelled owl. I don't think he knew exactly what he smelled because he had never been that close to an owl before, but he knew he smelled something strange. I stood there trying not to laugh while he sniffed all around me. He snuffed my trousers and then he began to sniff the haversack. When his, now, when his nose was nearly in the owl's face, the bird opened its beak and then snapped it shut again right on the end of poor old Mutt's black nose. Mutt gave a yelp you could have heard a mile away and went loping off to hide his hurt feelings under the garage. We put the owl in the summer house, and when Dad got home from work, the owl was sitting on the orange crate watching the gophers run around on the floor behind, below him. It kept him busy. His head kept turning one way and then the other until it looked as if he were going to unscrew it right off his shoulders. He didn't know what to make of the gophers because he'd never seen a live one before, but he was certainly interested in them. Better count your gophers, Billy, said my father. I have an idea they may start disappearing. By the way, what do you want to call your owl? I hadn't thought of any name for him until just that moment, but now one just popped into my head. I remember Christopher Robin's owl in Winnie the Pooh. His name is Wall, I said, and Wall he was forever after. Here's a picture of the owl in the summer house with the gophers. That's all for today. Love you guys.